Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love that drew salvation's plan and for your love that has been manifested to us as individuals that you have sent your spirit after us to bring us home, to convict us, to make us see our need of the grace of God. And Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God reached down, really down. And he came up from up in glory and came to this world, not only stained with sin, not only corrupted with sin, but with wickedness and evil. And right from the time of his birth, 
He subjected himself to every evil thing that the human flesh and the human mind can dig up. Yet, without any complaint, because of the great love, he continued to suffer until everything was climaxed on the cross. And he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he had to drink that cup, all in an effort, by his grace, to reach down for us. He dug us up, out of the pit, out of the merry clay, out of the corruption of the human race, and you have brought us to the Father. Only love, surpassing love, eternal love, can do such a thing. We are amazed at the manifestation of your grace to us unworthy, unqualified sinners. But you changed us. You transformed our lives. And you have brought us to sit down in heavenly places with yourself. We'll ever be grateful for the grace you manifested will ever adore you and worship you for reaching down and saving people like us. Not only that you have saved us, that you could even commission us. Creatures, child of despair before, but that you could fashion us into instruments that will bring glory unto you. We give all the praise to you. And we know it is by your grace and love alone. But Lord, we're not in heaven yet. And this world will seek to claim us back. The devil, the cohorts of Satan, the people that are in the world, they will seek to make us have allegiance to them once again. But Lord, if we depended upon our strength alone, we cannot hold out true to the end. But it's the love that saved that will also keep. And so we depend not only on your saving grace, but on your keeping grace. Not only on your saving power, but on your keeping power that will keep us until the very end. That at last will be with the redeemed of the Lord in heaven and be able to sing a new song all through eternity, glorifying and praising the name of the one who reached down in love for us. Lord, we pray you'll open our eyes more than ever before Amen. to see what you have done. To see what you have given us and to see the great privilege that you have given us in saving us from our sins and putting us in the kingdom to do something for the salvation of other people. Speak to our hearts this morning. Be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the name of the Lord as we've been here since yesterday, and the Lord himself has been speaking to our hearts as we have examined the event that took place on the Mount of Transfiguration. Not only that we examined it, you had the interpretation of that passage of scripture, as well as an application to our lives today. Today we're looking at an important subject of the Bible, not just because we always say that virtually every subject is important, but this is important in the sense that in the church world today, we have ministers, we have workers. Literally, they run into millions, full-time as well as part-time. The latest 
information and data we have on ministerial lists and data from Britain tells us that in Britain alone we have thousands of full-time ministers, preachers, and priests. And people who are speculating on the number of workers, Christian ministers, in a place like Britain, just cannot understand how Britain remains a field yet to be evangelized. On the data we have concerning Nigeria, Nigeria is the second uh, country all over the world that is supposed to be well evangelized. And as we read the data made available from the research centers that are studying how many ministers we have in each country, how many missionaries have been sent out from each country, Nigeria towers high in the whole of Africa. We have many Christian workers, ministers, and preachers. We're told that in Kenya alone, we have so many that you wouldn't understand why a major part of that country still remains unevangelized because of the number that we have then shifting our emphasis to America, United States of America, the money that is spent, the full-time workers that uh, they have, and also the missionaries that have been sent out. There's so many that you wonder why the world is still unevangelized. In America alone, there are single ministries that have thousands of workers and ministers under each ministry. Not just having about 500 full-time workers or having 1,000 full-time workers and ministers, but in each of the ministries, they run into thousands. And they have resources, manpower, strategy, and a lot of things. And yet, you then begin to think, why is it? With all those workers and ministers, why is it that America is not yet evangelized? And even the places that they have sent missionaries to, was still to see any country that is properly and well evangelized by the definition of the Bible, not by the definition of people that are sending missionaries out. But as you look at everything, you look around in our own church here, you look around in other churches, you'll see that what you're hearing about this morning has been one of the major things that were found lacking. The message is titled, The Unforgettable Encounter. Let's look away from other ministries, other churches, because in the final analysis, every man shall give account of himself. A man will not give account of his neighbor, neither will a man give account of a friend. But in the final analysis, every person will give account for the things he has done in the body. In the same way, every church will account for herself. You will remember that when Jesus sent John, the beloved, to the churches in Asia Minor, he spoke to those churches one by one. And he will say to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right, and while talking to the church at Ephesus, he did not mix up his message and demand of the church of Ephesus and bring in some ideas from Tatira. Every church will account for what that church has done. 
in our foolishness, in our carnality. We generally compare ourselves with other churches. I will say, this is Deeper Life Bible Church. That is, then we mention that other church. And we compare ourselves with those churches. And as long as we can pick another church that is a little bit lower in standard, lower in the impact they have on themselves and on society, our consciences will tell us we're doing right. We're going on well because we're better than that other fellow. But have you ever realized that the way life is, no matter how sick you are, you can always pick somebody else in the world. Maybe somebody even near you. Maybe somebody in the same hospital who you can say, I am sick, but I don't think I'm bad as so and so. It's always like that. Even that individual that the other fellow is referring to saying, I'm not as sick as so and so. If he also were to compare himself, or if the doctor were to talk to him to encourage him and give him a false hope, he could have said, you think you are sick? You think you have a problem? You need to understand the condition of the person I've just treated now before coming to you. There is always somebody to compare ourselves with that are lower in Christian life, lower in ministerial qualifications than we are. And the Bible has told us that when we compare ourselves with other people, we are not wise. That's another way of saying we are foolish. It's another way of saying we are carnal. But that we'll give account of ourselves. And because we'll give that separate account of ourselves, we need to mark the people in the scriptures who had encounter with God. And the encounter they had with God prepared them for life's assignment. Without the encounter they had, they couldn't have gone through. And the same thing we need to remind ourselves of today. That without having a definite encounter with the Lord, we will not be able to actually accomplish life's assignment. As a church, we have a peculiar danger. That other churches may not have. Not that they are better placed because they will still give account of themselves unto God. But our peculiar danger is that we have accepted and received the demands of the Great Commission on the whole church. And unconsciously, we have felt we are evangelizing the world. And we must do it very quickly. Do it now. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, all your strength. And that is what we have told our members in the churches. We have not linked their hearts with their hands. We have motivated them, excited them, whipped them up, made them to feel that you are God's chosen, selected man or woman for the hour. Everybody must evangelize. And in a real sense, in a true sense, evangelism is the work of the whole church. But we have emphasized that to the point that it has affected even workers and ministers and preachers. No call from God. No definite encounter with the Lord. All we can refer to has been the motivation of a preacher, 
in deeper life. And he has made us feel, felt so inconvenient that we just feel I must be doing something now. And many times we have seen our failure. Many times we have seen that our lack of encounter with the Lord is destroying us and destroying the work we're doing. Many years ago, before we started Deeper Christian Life Ministry, I used to go around with a group of young people, the Scripture Union. We went to camps, we taught in Bible studies, we had seminars, we had a lot of things that we did. Sometimes in the night, when the juniors have gone to sleep, we go ahead with a digging deep that was similar to some in-depth seminars in those days. But one day, we received information that somebody who had been going up and down with us, evangelizing, preaching in camps, leading Bible study, and being a camp commandant or adjutant, or all those uh, names and offices we gave ourselves in those days. He had done that for three years. Then he traveled abroad. And over there, he heard the gospel message. And gave his life to the Lord and became born again. But while preaching being born again in the scripture union, yes, and he was involved in preaching being born again with us in the scripture union. But because all those of us that came, we came as officers. We came as people that will look over the other children in the camp. I had a classmate myself when we were at the university. He was religious. And I spoke to him a number of times. But I didn't see any evidence that he was actually born again. When we came out of the university, one day he came to see me. And I learned that he was now a full-time worker, again with another body. But thank God, God had mercy on him, that later he became born again. And he was now able to do the work. He resigned from that and then started doing another thing. Became really born again. As strange as that may be, it is possible that you are here today. You think you are born again. You may not be born again. And everyone will give account of himself unto God. Now, we have done our best that we have selected workers, ministers, and preachers. But the best we have done sometimes will not even scratch the surface of the evidence that God has in your life. Because many of us cannot see beyond your testimony. Cannot see beyond what you say. Cannot see beyond what you profess. We may not actually know and see what you possess. But since eventually everyone will have to answer before God, you will need to examine your past experiences and ask if you have an encounter that is unforgettable. I've listened to preachers, maybe many preachers in Nigeria, and preachers outside Nigeria. And I've been amazed if I listen to a preacher for 10 years, 
outside deeper life or within deeper life. And not once, as that preacher mentioned when he was born again. It amazes me, shocks me, surprises me. And I've seen preachers that have national acceptance. They have never openly, very clearly outlined when and how they were born again. They never speak about it. Is it because they are forgotten? Is it because it was a type of process of metamorphosis? A process whereby people have been going to church and really they cannot tell when they had an encounter, when they had a change. All they know is that well, I was going to church and uh, by and by I just found myself appreciating that church and living like the rest of the members of the church and by and by I just felt that I don't belong to Satan anymore. I belong to God. That's finished. And there are people like that. They cannot lay their finger on the day, on the time, on the message they heard, on their repentance, and what actually happened unto them. And it's not just outside. I know preachers outside. But there are people here that since deeper life started, I've listened to them preach. I've never heard once tell how they were born again or when they were born again. Maybe they were born again. Maybe they were not. We don't know. They preach it, but they cannot confirm it with a personal encounter with the Lord. If they are born again, they are ashamed of it. They cannot tell. They cannot explain. They cannot bring it before the people and show that they are grateful they came to the Lord at such a time like this. Probably, it wasn't sound enough. Probably, they did not fully repent. Probably, it was not weighty on their own hearts. And therefore, you never know what actually happened to them. If you've been in the church for just one year in Lagos, you'll know I was born again. Virtually everybody under my regular pulpit ministry will hear within a few months the day, the time, the hour I was born again. I can never shake that conviction of me. If I go outside, and I go to minister outside, if I spend... A few, a few a weeks or a few days there, I cannot preach three to five messages. They'll get to know when I was born again. It's an unforgettable encounter. But when we have preachers, gospel preachers, that never talk about it, never can tell of it, they never have any testimony of any encounter with the Lord, salvation or sanctification or the Holy Ghost baptism, they are strange. It's strange. Some parents have children. They never talk about it. They can talk about child training. They can talk about others, but you never know that they are having children. That's strange. Somebody has had an encounter with the Lord and he never talks about it. That's strange. So that's why it's important for you and for me this morning to reconsider and to weigh once again the encounter that we had with the Lord. If it's real, re-examine it. 
If it's not real, re-examine it and see where are you. And where are we even today? I want you to look at Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Looking at the comments or the commentary in the New Testament concerning Abraham, that was an encounter with the Lord. He never forgot it. His children never forgot that experience. The New Testament makes us to understand he took it as a step of faith. And the record we have is that that was the first step of faith that Abraham took in his life. He turned away from everything that he had known, had a change of direction in life, and now he followed the Lord. The Bible says in the New Testament that he left where he was before, not knowing where he was going. At that time, he decided he will now live a life of faith, following the Lord. Brothers and sisters, not the life of faith that we brag about. Not the life of faith that we limit to, I believe God will provide all my needs. I'm living by faith. We don't mean that type of life. But a life that was totally in the hands of Almighty God. A life that was totally separated from the life in the past. You'll need to understand that it was dangerous in those days to be a stranger in a strange land. There wasn't civilization like this. And Abraham knew that when he went out of his own place, he was going out of security. And so to say, in human language, he was going into insecurity. He knew that he was living the environment of love, environment of acceptance, he was going out to a place that he never knew before. A place he wasn't sure they would accept him. He was living a place where he had a settled establishment. And he was going to a place of a pilgrim. Just moving about. And the Bible does say that if he had been mindful of the country from which he came out, he would have gone back. But as he came out, he was seeking another country, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That man had an encounter with the Lord. On the other hand, Lot followed Abraham. But will that be an encounter with the Lord? No. A maid that is living with you and you are bringing to church, changes her dressing, changes her language, knows about Bible reading, knows about quiet time. Is that an encounter with the Lord? A wife that you married before, and as you have married that wife, she, had, she wasn't born again, 
But when you were married, maybe you yourself, you were not born again. And after the marriage, somehow you became born again. And now you tell your wife, we're leaving this church, we're now going to this new church. Deeper life. And the wife said, wherever you go, I will go with you. And then, while you get to that church, your wife sees that they don't use jewelry. They dress in a particular way. They go to house fellowship. They go for Sunday worship. They go for Bible study. They go for revival hour. They go for retreat, December, and Easter period. And she changes all those outward things. And then, she started coming to church. Is that encounter with the Lord? No. Not born again? And your wife cannot say, that's where I knelt down. That's where I received the Lord. That's the very day, the very hour, the very time I had a change. She cannot tell. Like Lord. But she remembers the day she got married. She remembers the day you gave her money. She started a trade. She remembers the day that she became pregnant of the first child and the day she delivered, she remembered all that. The only thing she cannot remember, the day she came to the Lord as a sinner and she became born again and became a child of God, like Lord. And, you know, we have problems with such people. They're always looking for material things. They're in the church, but they're only looking for Healing, money, prosperity, peace in the family, blessing in the family, blessing with the in-laws, blessing with this one, blessing from that one. That's all they're looking for. They have come for the bread and butter part of the Christian faith. Persecution is not part of what they are prepared for. And if you are here, you are not just a wife of a minister. But now you yourself, you say that you are a worker. That's why you are here. But you are like Lord. You never had the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Separate, definite, from family conviction. Because we don't get convicted as a family. We get convicted on individual basis. You have never actually been convicted. You have never gone on your knees to actually pray and pray through and get saved. What you have discovered is that when you came, they preached a message. Not that you are really under conviction. They said, if you want to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he'll bless you. When you are sick, he will heal you. He'll be going around with you. If you have not been having contracts, you'll start having contracts. If you have not been happy, you'll be happy. Then raise up your hand. Then you raise up your hand. And then the minister said he claimed salvation for you and prayed for you. Foolish minister. And eventually you went back. That same night you still fought. That same night you still told lie. And then you came back to the church again. And then somebody gave them um, another message. Maybe a message on healing. Maybe a message on Holy Ghost. And just said, uh, well, but before we pray for those who are sick, if you want to receive Jesus as your personal Savior, then you raise up your hand. Then you also raise up your hand. And you did that about five or six times. One day, somebody said, ah, you are raising up your hand every time. When are you going to stop raising up your hand? You say, ah, that is true. I've raised up my hand uh, six times now. I think that's enough. I'm saved already. And you are there. And now, eventually, you started studying Bible. That's easy. We study Bible, those who are not born again, with the brain. Only those who are born again study with the heart. And there's a difference. When you read the Word of God, where do you feel that impact of the word of God? In your heart? Serious conviction? Very deep in your heart? Or in your mind and in your brain? There's a difference. When you are born again, there is a way, there is a place you feel the impact of the word of God. 
before you are born again, there's another place where you feel the impact of the word of God. And there are people who have not been born again. Like Lot, they have followed Abraham. We will think they were born again. Of course, he had material blessing. But God never spoke to him directly. Check up in your Bible. God never came to Lord and said, Lord, can I speak to you? No record. As for Abraham, Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. Abraham, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him to me on a mountain I will show you. Abraham, your marriage, there's something going on there. What your wife has said, that is what you will do. God always speaking to him. How about Lord? When did God speak to him? Now in the case of Abraham, he was always raising up an altar. And he will pray. Anywhere he go to, the very first thing he will do, he will raise up an altar and he will pray. Lord, raising up an altar, it was strange. He couldn't do it. He never did it. And how many people are like Lord? And you see that there was something significant in his life. He never, never knew how to take decisions. Because it wasn't in link or communication with the Almighty. Look at all the decisions he took. They landed him into trouble. And look at his life. The way his life was spent. The choices that he made. He did not have an encounter with the Lord. And here you are today. You want to make sure that before you proceed this year, it's still the first week of the year. You want to think over it again. Meditate on it again. Your personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have been burying it, dig it up. Speak about it to yourself, to members of your family, and to people around you. If you have been saved, and you cannot talk about it because of pride. Because, you know, I was only saved just a few years ago. So if I tell people, they will think so, you have been, you were saved just a few years ago. If you have that pride, it's doubtful you are saved. Because when you have been saved, you have repented of your sin, and you are so grateful even if it was yesterday, the gratitude is so great on you that you'll be able to say, do you know my brother, my sister, I got saved only yesterday? You'll forget about pride. You'll exalt Christ who has saved you. But for those who are ashamed of Christ, ashamed of being born again, ashamed that this is the time they knew the Lord, they are comparing themselves with other people. They're saying that um, uh, the pastor says that he has been converted now for more than 20 years. And if I just say I was converted three years ago, the gap is too much. I think I'll just say I'm born again. Your pride marks you out as a sinner. Marks you out as a person who doesn't have an encounter with the Lord. When you have an encounter with the Lord, all those things related with pride, you bury them. That's salvation. Pride is sin. But whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. When I was born again, there was a definite change. I knew I was born again. And I knew that this change was the result of my being born again. And if you say you are born again, you are still living in sin. You will give account of yourself unto the Lord. Because... The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And whatever work you are doing, if you are still living in sin, you are a sinner. It's only unfortunate that we say that we have the Holy Spirit. Those of us who are your leaders, either state overseer or district pastor. But the Holy Spirit never reveals to those leaders 
that this person is living in sin. And the church is suffering because of her spiritual blindness. And we have a lot of people who are living defeated lives, who are backslidden, and yet they're still working in the church. They do not have enough sincerity and innocence to come and say, I am sorry, I'm not living right, I cannot touch the work of the Lord. And we do not have enough revelation and discernment to say that that fellow is not living right, get out of the work. And because of that, the church is suffering. And if you are not careful, you are preaching as a pastor that is not born again, or that is backsliding, and you are still on the job. I cannot begin to tell you the things that might happen. One, if the blind leads the blind, both of them will fall into the ditch. Two, if people with evil power, powers of darkness, come into that church and they will come when you are not born again. Because they roam about wanting to find a place where they can do their havoc. And then they come into the church and here you are, you are not born again. You never pray. You don't know how to pray. You don't have quiet time. All that you can do is come and make noise at the pulpit. All you can do is after we have finished the preaching, you can pray, pulpit prayer. But personal prayer is not there. Discernment is not available. Grace is not available. You fight with your wife like any other sinner in the street. Inside the home, you get angry like any other unconverted fellow on the street. And there is no check. There is no grace. There is no conviction. Even after you have done all that, you could even beat your wife under closed doors and then put your hand on her mouth so she doesn't cry aloud during the week. And then on Sunday, you can still come and preach. The witches will come and visit your church. And you guess who they will kill first? The preacher that doesn't have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You are meat in their mouth. Your blood is what they will drink. A Pentecostal church. Pastors that will be sick all the time. Weak all the time. And be lured into evil all the time. And they will, and they will say, it's devil, it's devil, it's not devil. Is the lack of encounter with the Lord. If you don't have encounter with the Lord, you cannot live right. And if you are not living right, you might die. Because all these witches and wizards are there. If you have been sent to the village, the village is a terrible place, spiritually. And you are not born again. And you don't tell that state overseer and say, I'm sorry, I cannot go to the village. I've been managing. When I was in the town, if I go to the village, that's another story. They can carry you back from the village. You can get paralyzed. You can have mental problem. If you don't make sure of a personal encounter with the Lord. Or you say that now, I want to go and be, I'm on children area. And you don't have personal encounter with the Lord. Those children, sometimes they are even more terrible than the adult witches. And you don't, no encounter with the Lord. No real, basic, serious, definite salvation experience. What do you, what you find out? You'll find out that those children that you have in the class on Sunday, or during the Bible study time, they will divide you among themselves. They will ruin your life. Ruin your family. And you'll be saying, I don't know why. You know your trouble? The work of God you are doing without having an encounter with the Lord. If you are wise, you'll get out of that thing. That work is fire on you. It's terrible on you. When you have not got an encounter with the Lord, those people will destroy you. Or you go to areas where well, we have um, all these fanatical religious people and here you are you are not born again maybe you just have natural boldness 
and you preach, Jesus is Lord, the Spirit can confirm that because it's not your Lord. Jesus is Savior, the Spirit can confirm that because it's not your Savior. And then you challenge all those religions. And you say, I stand here as a preacher of the gospel. And all these other religions, they will see that Christianity is a real religion. And they overhear you. And because they are maybe occultic, they see that you have no basis for what you are saying. They say, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who is this one bragging on the pulpit? And then they test and they try you. And your own mentor. Here in Lagos, a sister went to, that's a sister in court. That's what we call them. Once they don't use jewelry and they have scarf on and they dress like these members of the choir are dressing now for singing. Once they dress like that, we say a sister. But everyone shall give account of himself. She went out to witness, evangelize, because we have told everybody that evangelism is the work of everybody. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, brother or sister, evangelize. And she went to evangelize, and she came across a particular cult, one of their members. And she started talking of Jesus, and Jesus, the Jesus of history, not the Jesus I have in the heart. And uh, that one said, shut up, don't continue. And she continued. And the man said, okay, you are talking about Jesus. I don't talk about Jesus. I have another thing I talk about. And I will show you, you will see the evidence of what I talk about. And he left her. They, they brought her to, the, to Bagada. Mental. Completely mental. I was in London. And in deeper life there. A sister came for counseling. Well, not really for counseling. They, they brought her. That's the way to put it. The husband, uh, you know, held her hand and the other people. And uh, she, she was completely off. And I asked what happened. Oh, they said she has been one of the sisters in the place of work in London. Those uh, people there, they were going to have a celebration for the witches. They do that publicly in Britain and some, some places of America too. And she said, I'm a Christian. I will not come. Oh, they said, you must come. What do you mean you are a Christian? That you must come. Oh, she said, no, I will not come because I serve Jesus Christ. They said, you are not serving Jesus. Come and join us and come. She said, no, I'm taking my stand. A sinner has no stand. Sinner has no foundation. What stand are you taking? You want to suffer persecution without being born again? You want them to be slapping you and almost killing you without being born again? You want to die without having Jesus as your personal savior? And you are challenging witches and wizards without being born again? Why don't you quietly go away and know that because you are not born again, you leave those people alone because they have power. And you don't have the power to be able to contradict or cancel their power. Eventually they went for that meeting. But she didn't go. At the time the meeting was going on, she lost her senses. And they brought her to the church dragged her. So it's one of our sisters. One of our sisters. That's what we call them. One of our sisters. And uh, she saw her husband and said, no, you are not my husband. You are not my husband. I saw me and said, this is my husband. This is my husband. Sister. That's what we're saying. Have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. We talk about Moses. He had an encounter with the Lord. We talk about Isaiah. He had an encounter with the Lord. We talk about Paul the Apostle. He had an encounter with the Lord. How about you? After you were saved, any other encounter with the Lord? You've seen Isaiah. What he saw. And then he spoke out and said, 
I am a man of unclean lips. And then the angel touched the lips with a coal from God's altar and said, Your sin, your iniquity is purged. That's an encounter with the Lord. And then after that, God said, Who shall I send? Who shall go for us? Then he said, Here am I. Send me. You see Paul the Apostle. And you see how God, how Christ met him on the way to Damascus. He had an encounter with the Lord. After that encounter, the Lord said, He is a chosen vessel. And I will show him how great things they will suffer for my name's sake. Why do we go about not having encounter with the Lord? Or if you had encounter with the Lord before, you became like Samson. And you have fallen through women. And you never opened up. You never accepted. You never confessed it. You are just patching up. But you are an adulterer. Already your mind has been affected. To the point that to even reverse and say, I want now to be living right is difficult. You cry. You say you repent. And privately you say, I will never do that again. But you still do it. And you are preaching. Or you say you are evangelizing. Or you say you are a full-time worker. Or you say that there is a section that you are leading in the church. And yet you know that you are not living right. How many marriages have we conducted? For people that have already had carnal knowledge between themselves. And they didn't tell us. And the people that were conducting the marriage, they are not like Peter. Who will say, how has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? They are not like Paul that will face that man and say, child of all subtlety and child of the devil, that you will be blind for a moment like this. Because the ministers are blind, there is no discernment. You just come for your wedding, your marriage. And things have been going on. What had been going under the bridge? And we never knew. How many of you have already committed abortion? They must not hear. What will they not hear? Everyone has heard already. All the angels have heard already. The presence of God has gone away from you. Whether they hear or they don't hear. The people, those that have heard, the millions and the myriads of angels that have heard, but it, whether they hear it here or not, that's what matters. Over there, the presence of God has departed. The glory of God has departed. All that remains is the empty outline we carry in our hand and the empty shout that we have over the people because you're an adulterer, because you're a fornicator, and you're still preaching. God have mercy on those branches where the preachers are preaching, and yet they are adulterers. Those who are stealing church money. Oh, they say I am pastor. That's what you call yourself. You are pastor. But the money that is coming into the church, you are stealing it. My brother, my sister, it does nothing to me. If you steal one naira from the church uh, account or the, from the church money, what does that do to me as a general superintendent? Nothing at all. Except that it does something to you. You lose your soul. You sell your soul for one naira. What, does he, what did he do to Peter or to James or to all the rest of the apostles when Judas was taking something? And he said, because he had the bag, he was stealing out of it. He did nothing for them. They were still eating. They were still having all their needs met. And Christ still met all their needs. And Jesus Christ, he knew. But he left him there. And said, I know you are following me. And all you want is the office of holding the bag. You want the bag? That's the bag. But you are better you are not born. And many of you have the bag. The money that is coming in. Nobody looks at it. Nobody takes account. 
Nobody keeps record. And you never send the correct record. And you're always balancing the account up at the end of the year. Expenditure. This, this, this. And then all the ones that you know that you cannot find out, you put miscellaneous. When you put miscellaneous, 15,000 naira. That's miscellaneous. That's how they do accounts. As pastor. The one that you spent in your family, miscellaneous. The one that you gave to your wife, miscellaneous. The one that you gave to your friends, miscellaneous. The one that you gave to your girlfriend in the church. When she was saying, huh, if uh, you don't give me money in time to go and buy pills and cancel this pregnancy, it will come out. And everybody in deeper life will know. And then you say, but there's no money now. Uh -huh, there's no money. Okay, we will see. Then you went to take church money to commit abortion. And you put miscellaneous, God sees you. We're not deceiving the church. We're deceiving ourselves. And it is an evidence that there is no personal encounter with the Lord. How many of you say you are workers and you can uh, inflate the receipts in your place of work? You are not full time. And you say that you are a Christian worker in deeper life. How many of you are cheating, not paying your tax to the government? And we say that we are Christian workers. How many of us now will fight? They slap you on the one cheek. You put your Bible and your bag down. And you say, huh, we are just coming from church, but I will show you. The deeper life of today, we, are, we don't take nonsense. It's not the deeper life of five years ago that will turn the other cheek to you. And you rough handle that fellow. And the person began to beg you, saying, huh, I didn't know that uh, deeper life people are strong like this. Oh, you say you don't take deeper life for granted now. We're different. You are different. I thank God I'm not in your company. Thank God that I'm not under your ministry. Thank God that I don't have to listen to your preaching. Otherwise, how could we make heaven if we listen to the preaching of all these people that are fighting? And they don't have any conviction. They can use abusive language on ushers. Abusive language on their own children right in the church. They call them dog. They call them bad, bad names. And uh, even their wife, you need to see them at the car park. What have you been doing? I've been waiting for you. A foolish woman. I told you that I don't want to be getting late. Now look at it now. We came for the second service. And we're already late going back to work. Somebody is coming to visit me at home. That's what I'm saying. I don't like being foolish. You know what Jesus said? That when you call a person a fool like that, you are in danger of judgment. And you are a zonal leader. You are a coordinator. You are a preacher. What are we going to do? Are we going to continue like that and say, God, forgive me? God, that's how God forgives? You commit adultery, you commit fornication, uh, and you just say, God, uh, we're going for a zonal meeting now, and I need your power, I need your anointing, God. Uh, well, I know that that's it, but forgive me. For that's how God forgives? When David committed adultery, that's how God forgave him? When he cried and prayed? Is that how, how we seek forgiveness? No altar, no prayer, no tears, no conviction. Is that how we have the encounter with the Lord? You fight, you quarrel, you abuse your wives, and there is unrest. And some of your wives are already saying, I thought I was marrying a Christian. I thought I prayed to know the will of God. Oh God, where did I make mistake? They are reporting you to God like that, and you are still walking. And you are still preaching. And you don't go to settle with God. Lock yourself up and pray. When Christ met Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus, and said, go to Damascus, he will be showing you what you will do. How did he pray? Five minutes prayer. Knelt down for five minutes and said, God, well, I've been a sinner. I've been what everybody is a sinner. But you know that I was doing my best. In any case, forgive me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's how they get forgiveness. He was three days and three nights. He couldn't eat. The conviction that came upon him. And God said, Ananias, go and see that man. Behold, he prayed. That's prayer. The prayer you are praying, does it have record in heaven? The prayer we pray that we still go back to fighting. 
You cannot control your mouth anymore. You cannot control your temper anymore. You cannot control anything anymore. And preachers that can eat the food of three people. That's self-control. The fruit of the spirit. We have temperance and self-control. You say you don't drink wine. You drink more than wine. The money you spend on Maltex, is it not as much as what they are spending on their beer? And uh, you, you sit down over there, you eat and eat and eat, and you say, how about this? How about this? And your wife uh, said, uh, well, uh, all the food available I have given to uh, it's not enough for me. I have not even eaten. I don't care for that. All I know is that I'm not, I'm not satisfied yet. That's Christianity. A glutton is a Christian. A drunkard is a Christian. A liar is now a Christian. A fornicator is now a Christian. You who are the women in the church that you have done to this church what Saul did to Israel that he selected them for himself. The one to carry plate, the one to wash clothes, the woman to cook food, the woman to do this and to do that. And they are not just made, you are not paying them anything. They, they are just lining up. You have selected them in the church like that, running errands for you. That's Christianity. That's how we are given the Bible. And many of those women are now closer to you than even your own wife. You will discuss with them things you have not discussed with your wife where you are going, where you are not going, what you are doing, what you are not doing. You discuss with those ladies in the church. They are very, very close to you. But even your wife, she doesn't know all that. You are still a Christian. Christianity. That's how we get to heaven. When Jesus comes, how many people have had enough encounter with the Lord that will go at that time? Can't we come back after we are backsliding? Peter, after he had denied the Lord, the Lord looked at him. How did he do it? He didn't say, okay, Lord, you know, everybody has his weakness. I'm sorry for this. Forgive me, forgive me. Amen. That's how you do it. When you've done something wrong. But we know how Peter repented. That's the Bible. And now we've turned the church to a church, a group, having license. You call it faith. It is presumption, not faith. When you are committing that sin over and over, you are not having victory in your life. You know what our people call sanctification now? Well, they know they have been living in sin. They said they were saved. But now when they eventually decide on their own, that with that lady, they are not going to be committing immorality again. Then they say now, they are sanctified. That's sanctification. That's what you learned. And everything has become completely destroyed. But this is the beginning of the year. If you didn't have encounter with the Lord before, this is the time. Have encounter with the Lord. When I prayed, and had encounter with the Lord many years ago, I wasn't conscious that other people were around me. I just prayed. I didn't know whether I shouted or I didn't shout. I, don't, I wasn't thinking of that. All that I knew was that the Lord was calling me. And I must respond. And I actually responded. And thank God, I know that I have encounter with the Lord. Not just because I'm preaching. Not just because miracles are happening. But because there's a deep conviction within me. And I can say, the things I used to do, I do them no more. Called my wife, I think yesterday or two days ago. I said, do you know that yesterday, I was just thinking and praising God. She said, for what? I said, I just felt if I wasn't born again, how you would have been miserable as a wife. And I told her what I could have been doing, what my life was like, and how hard I could have been on her. 
But that, you know, when I tell you to do this, and you say I'm coming, and you're still doing another thing, or when I want you and I'm really hungry, terribly hungry, after counseling and preaching and preaching and preaching, and then I come back, and maybe you are still counseling, and then I wait for you, and then I still have to wait another one hour before the food is ready. You know, I just want to tell you that salvation is great. I just sat down thinking with myself just two days ago that it's good to be saved if I wasn't saved. And those ch the children that we have, if I wasn't saved, they would have known that life is hard. But when you are saved, there must be a change. What we're asking for in the church is that everybody must have this definite supernatural change. If you're living in adultery, come to the Lord. Not just raising up your hand, be definite and say, Lord, this sin will stop. And you'll pray until you are forgiven. If you are stealing money from the church or from other people, from your place of work, know that you are a sinner, a thief, and a robber. And you'll pray. If you have secret affection, that you have not even given any action to, to any woman, any lady in the church, even though you have not done the real act, Jesus said, when you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery already in your heart, and here you are, you have a woman at home, a wife at home, but you are still lusting after other people's wives, or ladies in the church, or ladies outside the church. Even if you've not done the act, this is the time to repent. And come to have a personal encounter with the Lord. And if you have gone off to do the evil thing, you should make restitution. Well, there are people that will not make restitution. And you might think that you fool anyone. You don't fool anyone. Normally, when I talk with people, I can be embarrassingly clear. And I will ask that here is what we have known about you. But how about other things we have not known? Your relationship with women. I know when they cover up. But when I cannot handle them and hold them by the hand, I keep quiet. But they have not deceived me. I know that the day of rapture will tell the rest of the story. And for a lot of us, the day of rapture will tell us the rest of the story. It may not be long. It may be very, very near. Then you will know if your general superintendent has just been preaching or he has an encounter with the Lord. The day of rapture will tell you the story. You'll know if your state overseers, your pastors, and we who say we're Christian workers, members of the choir, we will know it will not be hidden when we get up there and we say, where is so-and-so? Where is so-and-so? We'll know the rest of the story. Here we see through a glass darkly and we do not know all things. By the time is coming, we will know all things. How will it be with you at that time? What's your life like? Are you a real child of God? Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For the seed of God abides in him, remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. If you don't have an encounter with the Lord, check it off. If you had before, but you are backslidden on Delilah's lap, and you have lost the power and the anointing of God, come back to God. But if you have not backslidden, Tell God, you know this is all by grace. And if you don't watch, the devil seeketh whom he will sift as wheat. But Jesus said unto Peter, but I prayed for you. Oh, Peter said there is no problem. But there was problem. Oh, Peter said, even if it's dying, I will die with you. And Jesus said, you'll see it. You'll deny me. I said, if all these other people backslide and deny you, not me. But he did. 
and he had to weep for his backsliding and foolishness. Here we have come this week not to excite anybody, motivate anybody, not to uh, pump you up, excite you, and raise up your emotion, but to come to a solemn assembly, solemn convocation, and think about your life, think about what you are doing, think about your encounter with the Lord. Before we continue in the, in the rest of the Congress, and before we continue the work of the Lord, let's settle it this morning, having an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. The other things I should still have spoken about, but this is enough. Be sure of your encounter with the Lord. Let's rise up and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you because this morning you have really spoken to our hearts. Eternal Lord, you love each and every one of us and you love this ministry and that is why you have shown us this message again today to ensure, Lord God, that we live a life that really honor you and that we are able to really do your work as we ought to do it. Eternal Father, I'm praying and I'm asking, Lord God, that as many as may be here, and um, for one reason or the other, they have not yet had an encounter with you, and yet they are preaching the gospel, <laughs> Father, and yet they are carrying your word here and there. I'm praying, dear Lord God, as we are looking up to you this day, 